Welcome everyone again to Iron Edge podcast. We are super excited about this one. It's our first one uh, back from just three months of, of ministry in Ukraine. And uh, we decided to talk to uh, some of the people that are just doing some pretty awesome things over, over there. Um, we're going to talk with Bogdan. We've had to anonymize pretty much everything just out of security concerns because he is still working extremely hard in uh, the conflict area, in the combat zones. Uh, to help people, to evacuate people, to provide humanitarian aid. But really what we want to talk about is the calling um, on his life, uh, what it's like to answer that call to really serve, you know, when it's necessary and needed. And so uh, we hope we get something out of this. Uh, try not to cry. We had a hard time. <laughs> so let's get into it. So I, I, I want to introduce um, real quick and give a little background on you without being too in depth. But Bogdan and I have spent quite a bit of time together over the past few months in Ukraine. He's from Ukraine, north of Kiev, and has experienced just some of the horrendous things that are going on there, as well as just seeing God's. Uh, miraculous hand in a lot of different things and, and the opportunity really to serve other people. But just a little background, he's worked with a Christian organization out there for years in operations. And when this thing kicked off in Ukraine, the call went out for, for volunteers, people that could help evacuate the vulnerable out of some of the conflict areas, as well as bring in aid. And that mission has just not stopped since this thing kicked off and uh, they found themselves on a daily basis just trying to support those that are in uh, in dire straits in a conflict zone and at a level of combat that i've never seen before in my life after having gone through a few different conflict zones um, but we're so grateful to have uh Jan bogdan and just to be able to find out more about not just what you're doing you know physically going out and providing the support but really talking about what God's done in your life and in the lives of other men that you've seen in, in Ukraine regarding coming together and serving and being a light unto others. But I, I know that there's a, there's a conscription law, right? In, in Ukraine right now, where if you have a certain, certain number of children, right? Or special circumstances, men can, can actually leave the country with their families and, you know, be refugees in, in some of these countries that are receiving refugees. Mm -hmm. You fall under that, that exemption, mm -hmm. right? For, for conscription. And mm -hmm. I'm curious, I mean, that's kind of one of the things that, that just really hit me with, with you guys when I was working with you was you don't have to be there. You can be with your family, but for some reason you chose to stay and continue to serve. And I just like to talk about that a bit, but, but first off, to give, give everybody a kind of like a little bit of your, your background and, and and by the way everybody we're we're anonymizing this for a reason so you're not going to find out too many details but at the same time we want you to get to uh, the story and, and what's really going on but if you could tell us a little bit background on yourself what you do there in in ukraine uh, in ministry that'd be great hello everyone uh, my name is uh, bogdan and i'm from ukraine north of kiev and I'm 35, and out of those 35 years, I'm ministering for 17 years. And uh, I have a family and three kids that I love really much and miss uh, about them because they are away. And uh, when everything started, I, you know, take care about my family first, of course, and then people and kids whom I serve who are really close to me because I'm ministering for 17 years already, as I mentioned, and you cannot stay or stand aside, see when it's people who will be maybe dead if you will not help them. So 
it was not a question for me. It was just an assignment that I need to accomplish, like need to do. There was no either or. I just went and tried to help. That was main direction for me, that I need to take care of them because you need to start from yourself. Of course, I can, you know, go to different people, try to ask them to help, but I usually start from myself. And then when people see some good examples, some deeds, because during the war, it was really bright. A lot of men, they were scared that on a, uh, on a checkpoint that they will receive the invitation to army or they will be taken away to army. And somebody need to go forward to check and to say that it's not true, that if you help him, if you participating, if you evacuating people, if you bringing humanitarian aid, all those fears are, will be ruined and you will be free to go. So that's what's happened. That's why I, I'm helping others because it was not a choice for me. It was an assignment for me from God because this is, this is my actual calling that I'm doing for 17 years already. Yeah, and you, you worked with um, mostly with uh, children, like orphans and things like that in the past. And, and uh, I know that you guys were actually able to do quite a bit uh, when it comes to evacuating children out of those areas as well. Tell us a little bit about what, you, what you've been doing, like specifically without giving up too much information. When, when the war, when the invasion started, and I, I don't want to say when the war started, the war started back in 2014. We all yeah. know that everybody in Ukraine knows mm -hmm. that. But when the, the special operation, right, quote unquote, <laughs> started, okay. how quickly were you guys able to start doing evacuations and things like that? And how many people were you, you actually getting out? That you, you can estimate, I'm sure you're not keeping track, but. So uh, I received a call from my best friend at 5 a.m. that uh, Russian troops invading and break, breaking the uh, border and at our direction. And there will be like maybe five to seven hours that they will be here in our city. So that gives us no much time that nobody know what to expect, like bombing or shelling, nothing. I just saw in my window that there are guys park their jeep and take off some rpgs and like it's just across my flat like what's going on so fast like in maybe hour an hour and a half so first thing that we uh, made we take all our team there was like a pre 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 plan i don't know that specific thing that we need to do if we're has been started because there was lots of talks about this invasion. And so everyone knows where to go, whom to call, what grocery to take, where the gasoline was situated. Like the people already know what to do. And there was a list of people whom we serve, whom we know to, that need to be evacuated in the first, in the first part. And uh, then we evacuate, when we evacuate our families and our team, then we take care about those kids, orphans, and their families. We just take them in our vans. And at th that day, particularly for the two, three hours, we evacuated 50 people. And then after a few days, when we realized that uh, the Russian troops are not able to break into the city itself, they was all the time on the edges. There was lots of uh, fights, but it was, I don't know if, if i able to say like that, but this was comparatively safe yeah, because through all the war, I know that it was God protection for sure. A few hour vehicles was shot and there was some, not destruction, but some damage. And through that point, nobody of our um, uh, drivers was harmed or Nobody from our people whom we serve was also harmed. So it was God protection. It was God hand that bring us through all this um, time. So we, through all the nearest months and a half, we go back and forth between West Ukraine and our region and creating people. It was maybe 150 to 200 people per day 
that we brought to West Ukraine. And then when we're going back, we bring some humanitarian aid, medicine and uh, food and some other things. We work closely with the local social service. They help us to find out where the, the biggest need, whom we need to evacuate the first. Of course, and the first part was uh, big families or the, the people with special needs. Then they will take care about women. And then, and then <laughs> if we saw some specific thing that, for example, men who are not capable to go to war, then we can help. But other way, we never evacuate men from our region. Briefly. Yeah. I understand that. We had a lot of conversations re regarding that. I ended up counseling a lot of pastors and people in ministry because they were conflicted over the fact that they didn't know whether they should continue doing what they're doing, which is what you were doing, providing aid, or if they should go fight. And a lot of them, were like, I feel these feelings that I've never felt before of anger and hatred, and I don't know what to do with them. So we ended up talking a lot about the difference between killing and protection and things like that. We talk a lot about cowardice. Cowardice is, according, from what we gather in our little group here with Iron Edge, it's a, a plague right now around the world. Just men have not had to really have their metal tested where they have to make those decisions on whether or not they're going to go into a conflict zone and get shot at to rescue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those that are vulnerable and weak when we believe God's called us to that as men specifically. Mm -hmm. Hey, you, you're built a certain way. You have a certain mindset for a reason. God gave you that. So go use it to, to, to help people. Uh, and right. we see, like you were saying, people just too scared to even go through the checkpoint to find out if they're mm -hmm. going to get prescripted. So they just don't, they sit and they don't move. So yeah. it's very interesting to, to hear, hear what you're saying and totally understand exactly what you're saying. During that time, so when you first started out and, and were uh, starting to evacuate, what was going through your own mind? You said it wasn't a choice, which I, I understand that. There's always a choice, of course, but I understand when you say there wasn't a choice, uh, you just had to do it. But uh, what was going through your mind when you were starting to go in to get to people out, when you start getting into those hot zones where you're getting shot at and things like that? Can you share any of that or, or how it felt? I don't know. Maybe it was, uh, maybe it was uh, like an adventure for me. And it's not, uh, I didn't probably feel the real reality at that time because I was really into helping people. All those shots, all, all those bombings, uh, it's happening all over the places. I remember when I'm driving to one of the bomb shelters where it was 120 people staying without uh, food, without water, fresh water, without diaper. There was a lot of a lot of people that was really old, and there was they need those diapers because all the bomb shelling was, you know, lots of bad smells and it just nightmare. So knowing the need knowing that there are kids, knowing that there are women, you are not actually thinking about risk. There was like, mm, sometimes there was uh, uh, special tanks or machines shutting near us in our direction. We would, we would usually just hit our hands down, though it's not helping in any way in the car, <laughs> and just keep driving forward. And upon on God, maybe we was not, I don't know, wise enough doing that. Probably we, because we don't have any experience uh, be at the combat zones, knowing what conflict look like, how it can harm you, how it can harm your friends. We just do what we was capable to do. Praise God that he protected us. And there was few times that I was scared, really scared when like some, uh, you know, volunteers who helping army put our car, car aside of the road saying that they're uh, right now there are fly flights or jets coming here to drop the bombs. So turn off your light and we we'll, we'll lock the car, turn off the light and put the car near the forest. And there are other group of the 
Ukrainian like army guys going through us and saw the really suspicious car standing <laughs> on the edge of the forest and they stopped there and then was scary when they drag us from the car, pull us from the car, shoot, uh, not shoot, but pull the shotguns in our heads. We take our hands up for 15 minutes trying to explain who we are and what we are doing here. So this was probably the scariest moment, uh, despite all the shuttings, all the missiles attack. And also one of the, one of the bright examples for us, when we heading towards our city, there was uh, two places where we usually spend the nights. And uh, our city specifically uh, uh, surrounded by the river and the bridges. And the uh, Russian troops can destroy all the bridges and there, there will be no way from us to evacuate people or go into the city. So we try to spend night before crossing the river. And there was night when we need to choose to go our farm that belonged to our organization or to spend night in the church that are a little bit further from the farm. And because of different uh, circumstances, because of the uh, time that was really late, we decided to stay at this church. And the next day at 4 a.m., we received call from our security that their plane flight above our farm and drop a, a seven bombs, seven both bombs, which cause lots of damage. Praise God, no destruction. Their one tractor was destroyed completely. Lots of buildings was harmed, but there was huge risk for us to receive wound or be killed with those shrapnel. So it was one of the miracles from God. And <laughs> I saw that God, take care of us all the time. Wow. Uh, Bogdan, I, it's such an honor to talk to you. And I know, I know guys like you, because Pete's like you, where you just, uh, you, like you said, in your words, you, you're just answering the call as a calling on your life and as an assignment. So there's no question. And so you kind of, as we say, you just run right into the fray, mm -hmm. but the tales that you're telling us, these aren't just, these aren't just made up stories. This is real life stuff. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I think of these kind of things, uh, I put them in the category of heroes of faith. We talk about that in the Bible and, you know, it's easy to read in the Bible, these, these stories about men and uh, they almost are so far removed from our, reality that we you know that it's just a story and the mm -hmm. same thing is true for for people that have never experienced what you've experienced and so i'd like to tie together the guy sitting here probably mostly in the in the u.s but <laughs> the people that have never experienced uh this kind of thing and ask you the question of how has this this conflict and this whole situation really tested your faith and and by that i mean n not just your like your daily trust in god but the mm -hmm. actual you're actually the whole belief system and what mm -hmm. god is doing as a christian as one who serves you know how how has this situation maybe tested you or even affected your your faith <laughs> this is probably will be one of the most uh, interesting question for me because this conflict i can tell it like that put all my values on the places before this conflict my value was not on the spot they need to be and for example when i received this call from my friend that the russian troops invading our region i think about three things specifically first of all of course it was god <laughs> and i prayed hard for him to take care of me my family and all the kids whom we serve and their families so god was in the first place immediately the second was my family that 
you know, sometimes we as men, men try, try to do lots of things in the ministry, in the work, and put our families on the, on the second place, which is not right. It should be right after the God. So this conflict helped me to understand where my family need to be. And then third, it's my ministry and its closest people, family, and the closest surrounding that I have. So those three things directly go on the spots they need to be. Before that, I take care about lots of things. I take care about some values that was not value, like vehicles, I don't know, money, documents. Nothing was valued to, till that time. A house, I don't care about all of those. I just left it behind. That's it. So God, family, and the ministry, and uh, was was on the spot that and it stated like that till that time it was one of the brightest lessons for me from god yeah so so the word i that i'm hearing is actually priority so mm -hmm. what are your priorities and when you face okay. when you face when you're facing right. death really your mm -hmm. priorities should quickly align <laughs> yeah and and yeah. Uh, if they're out of alignment it proves maybe like pete talked about cowardice or selfishness mm -hmm. and so yeah so for our guys that are listening man i hope that i hope that is a it's a good what we call gut punch a good reality <laughs> check yeah. Yeah. you know because you know yeah. i'm sitting here in the middle of the u.s like really mm -hmm. even if even if it was, there was something to to pop off in the US, I'm like so deep in the center of the United States that the chance of harm coming to me is so minuscule, you know? So I'm, I, I'm saying all that to say, I'm so just relatively safe and I don't have to worry about any of those kind of things. But when you talk about priorities, man, the, the fact that, the fact that from so many men in Ukraine, they, they didn't have a choice necessarily to organize their priorities. And, and I'm sitting here with the opportunity to get things in line and to line up with God's way without all that harm. I hope that our men really can understand and hear what you're saying. You know, one other question and, uh, that I have for you before you move on uh, further with maybe some details is, you know, I don't know. Actually, maybe this is better suited for the end, but it's just like, <laughs> since we're talking about it, what would you say to that, to that guy that's just sitting there in comfort and the guy that just has no worries and no cares and like, oh, so let's see, should I take care of my family or should I go play golf today? <laughs> you know, like, what would you say to them now? Oh, I understand that God created our world specifically and with a specific way and a specific way of functioning. And I know those people, for example, who choose to not take care of the family, who choose to do nothing, I don't know, hang out. They miss the real point of life. They actually miss the life because right now my family are not with me. I evacuate them to Europe. And uh, it's already two months, and I'm completely broken. I don't know what I, I don't actually do anything right now because my family is absent. It, it was, it is part of myself, me that are absent. So it's so hard to live. It's so hard to do things. And I understand how vital for me to have family near, to have my kids near, that they can take care of them, that I can show my life, a lot to them, my spouse that's supporting me, that encourage me to do various things. And for example, if I, if I face something hard, some conversation, some, some tests through life, she always helped, she always near. And while she's absent, it's, her, it's harder. So I encourage all of US men to not the missed life, the missed real opportunity to be near your family, to take care of, about your family, to love them and to show this love as long as possible because the, the life is short and there are 
big need to spend it in a the best possible way, and that's to be near your family with God and the ministry. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it right there. I, I even saw we see that here, and it's hard um, because we live. I always go back to this thing called Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and it's this pyramid where they kind of categorize where people live. Right at the bottom, you have people in developing nations who just every day is survival, right? So they can only think about a certain amount of things. The middle, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, we have a little bit of infrastructure and we have jobs and things like that. You know, we can relax a little bit more, but we're still kind of in that mode of, we don't have, we have limited choices, right? At the very top is, are these people who have a lot of choices, very good security. And they typically end up, like psychologically, they end up being able to create their own realities and things like mm -hmm. that. It's like, oh, well, I don't, I don't have to do this. I don't have to do this. There's no pressure on it. A, you know, it kind of goes back like we're fighting with this gun control issue right now, which I think is very interesting, uh, especially in Ukraine, because I've worked there for so long where it was so difficult to get a weapon. And now everybody, they're like handing out AK-47s to everybody, you know, because that, that reality has hit, you know. But it's in the U.S. Most people live at that top level where self-actualization, they have the ability to realize all these things and contemplate all these things. And it, it's unfortunate, but I mean, even in the Bible, it's kind of evident. Every time Israel got to that prosperity point in life, they'd always go off the rails, idol worship, all this stuff, right? Focusing on other things that aren't important, you know, worshiping other gods, dragging their families with them to do that. And then God would always be like, hey, that's not going to last for very long, you know? And he'd put some pressure on them and give them a dose of reality to get them back into and mm -hmm. I think that, unfortunately, it would be really nice if we didn't have to get to those points in life, you know, for God to kind of say, hey, look, you, you know, you, you're going this way. I'm going to have to direct you back this way. And in the United States, I just feel like we're at that level where there's not a lot of pressure uh, put on men to really figure out what those priorities are. But it would be mm -hmm. nice if we could just figure that out without that pressure and then spread that and, and pass that on gener generationally to our children so they understand what's so important. I think there's been times throughout history, especially in the United States, where that has been the, the forefront, like our forefathers, the people who founded our nation, that was what they pushed. Those family values, you know, Christian morals, Christian values. And I think that's why the United States prospered so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Seeing that in, the in Ukraine right now with the churches and the denominations and the walls kind of falling and everybody coming together to really work together as the church. Yeah. You know, and I think that's going to actually shape shape the country in, in a better way, although it's a horrible way to get there. Right. Mm -hmm. But I keep telling men here, it's like, look, don't wait for those situations to happen. It might not be a countrywide thing, but in your own life, you don't want to wait for disaster to hit uh, before you figure this stuff out. Figure it out now yeah. and then watch God mm -hmm. bless you and watch God protect you and watch God keep you and push you forward. So I think it's it's very interesting. I also saw that in Ukraine, though, in in the areas where you guys were, where it's really hard hit, there was a lot of what you're saying, where you, people have figured out who they are in Christ, mm -hmm. what their mission is. But then I'd go further, like close to the border of Poland or something like that, in some of these other cities, mm -hmm. and they're kind of like, eh, whatever. It's not really affecting them. Yeah, they have air raid yeah. fires every day and every night. That never happen. Nothing ever comes of it. But other than that, life goes on and they still kind of fall into that. I don't know what my priorities are yet, like, mm -hmm. even in the in in Ukraine. still. So, so I, it would be nice, like I said, if we could get to that point where we don't have to have that kind of pressure put on to us. But I know in my own life, it took that. It took going to war a few times, having to question my mortality, to figure mm -hmm. out what's important, you know, in my life. And it is exactly like you said, family. When you're away from family, you realize it, you know, and you realize how much you need them, how much God put man and woman and families together to support each other, not just for the father to support everybody, you mm -hmm. know? And so I think that's, that's great. Are you seeing a difference in, you're really involved in ministry. You, you, you go to a church and a couple churches there, I think. And uh, have you seen a difference in the church, like the big C church in, in Ukraine since the, the conflict started? Yes, there was, unfortunately, there was lots of pastors who run away, which was 
super heavy for the church members to go through. And uh, some of the church, I heard the story, for example, that one of the biggest church in our region, and then the pastor going, he, he ran away before the, or in time of the conflict or, or before the conflict, but he was not in the church and he was not, it was his uh, church members, he not helping. So what, what, when conflict is over uh, in our region, he come back, he preach, he tried to leave us, as we usual, as nothing has been happened. And then he w- w- want to go from the stage and go back to the end of the hall. And when he crossed some of one of the ladies, the older, older ladies, she said, well, pastor, looks like you betrayed us. And it was like, I don't, I, I don't want even like imagine how it heard this words from your, from your church that you, you betrayed them when you run. And um, from the six active church that we used to have before the active conflict, uh, we, during the conflict, there was three that functioning. And this three right now, overcrowded despite lots of people went from oh sorry run away to i'll cut that <laughs> run out run away yeah run away to europe to western ukraine the church is still overcrowded and maybe 60 to 80 percent of people who right now at the church they are non-believers and when i when we first started doing the ministries and everything's starting to settle. I have been to the church and I saw lots of people that I never saw before. And there was not even one free spot, even one free seat. Everything was booked and people keep coming to the church. Why? Because church during the conflict zone was a uh, conflict uh, combat, active conflict was near. They, uh, we were, helping to feed the uh, fed the people we was helping to cure the people we drew do everything we could despite the war despite the bombing we was near and this was vital for the people and through that we try to show of course we showing them the god's love god's care and right now they are responding to this care of god they want to reach to god they want to came to the church they want to spend time with the Believers, why? Because believers are a hero for them, and it's one of the one of the way we could reach the people if we will be helping people who have a biggest need. Because in our city during this conflict, there was no free fresh water. People go into the uh, dirty rivers, take the water because the the pipes was destroyed. There was no water in the facet. And church was one of the places where you can come and take the fresh water, which is amazing. And it was something. And those churches right now are overcrowded and they and they understand that they doing the right things. They are satisfied with their ministry and they keep going forward. And I and I know that this will bring lots of fruits in your future i mean i have to jump in here because uh, you know part of my role here mm-hmm. with iron edge is a uh, local local church local missions pete's mm-hmm. pete's over global global missions and i don't know whether to scream or cry right now like my there's such <laughs> such turmoil in my soul as i hear you say this because you know since the pandemic that's the big thing that we faced we can't get people to church. I mean, mm-hmm. so many churches in the U.S. have disappeared in the last year and a half. Like, they no longer exist, two and a half years. And, you know, people don't come to church out of convenience because they can watch it online. And, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and point the finger because when it first, when the pandemic first came and we didn't go to church in person, I welcomed it. I've been doing church my whole life 
And I was like, oh, man, this is so nice. I've been going to church every Sunday and Wednesday for 40 plus years, you know, and and just the pressure of, you know, having to get ready. And I'm here like just even hearing myself talk right now. I'm like, how ludicrous, how ridiculous is this when you have a church that is literally, you know, there's bombs dropping and and the church is growing. I mean, if if our guys aren't hearing anything right now <laughs> from this podcast, like there's no hope. There's no hope left. But but I do know that there's hope because of men like you that are yeah. that are answering the call and that really when faith is being tested actually faith is growing your testimony is just so powerful right now but but again i'm just just so stirred up right now about the church here in the u.s and the excuses that we hear and just and even the politics you know (laughs) what i'm hearing is science isn't saving you you know affirmations aren't saving you Faith. The government's out of it. The government's yeah. out of it. They're not doing anything. The church is spearheading all that humanitarian work. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Initially, like you said, our founding fathers, this is some of the reason that our documents are set up the way that they're set up, you know, so that people could come together in faith, serve, and and, and grow that way. But I mean, gosh, thank you so much for sharing those words. And but it, it shows us too, like it shows us that the church is not a place you go to, to, to consume, to be entertained, mm-hmm. to read. Yeah, you're going to receive, right? That, that's part of it. But it's, it's there to serve. You know, if, if everybody's a consumer, then, then what's left, you know? And, and then if you have leaders who are cowards, obviously, and that's coming out. And I'm not, we don't mince words here. This is the way it is. You have cowardly leaders in many churches all over the world right now. That would tuck tail and run at the first sign of danger. Mm -hmm. The cool thing is that they are not the church. The church is much greater than the buildings, the denominations, and everything else. And you're seeing the church work, even though those guys left. But at the same time, there needs to be more people there to mentor, to disciple these newcomers that are coming in. You know, it's like this opportunity is there. There's so many people coming in that are hungry for the word of God. And you need strong leaders, people who understand that being a part of the church means that you're going to serve. I, I always bring this up during a podcast. The only reason we don't go straight to heaven when we receive Christ is to serve. Why the heck else are we on this crappy planet dealing with all this nonsense? If it was just for us to get something, we receive Christ, Christ, go to heaven, be done. right? But we stay here on this planet so that we can share that with other people. And I'm writing a book right now called Killing the Christian Persona, and it's about, there's a leadership chapter in there that specifically talks about how every single Christian, if you receive Christ, you are called to be a leader. You're called mm-hmm. to lead others to Christ. You're called to, to show them the right path. And, and if you're a leader and you can't even do that, if you're saying that you're a leader and then you're running away when that calling comes in, you're, you're a false prophet. You're actually leading people down the wrong path. And I, I don't want to be that. And a lot of those guys don't even realize that they are until that, until their metal's tested, until that fear comes in, they, they make a choice either to, to do what God's called them to do or to admit that they're actually not Christians in the first place, mm-hmm. which is probably a lot of what's happening right now. So, man, I, I hear that testimony, the coolest thing about it. And I saw it, I saw it in Lviv and a bunch of other places with the churches that I visited. And they're like, most of these people here were not here a couple months ago, you know, and our yeah. church has grown 80, 90 percent mm-hmm. because the church was available to serve and has spearheaded that because the government is funny. If the government was involved in that a lot, I think it would actually kind of stifle the opportunity for the church to serve. Yeah. But because the government in Ukraine right now, can only focus on the military side of things. Mm-hmm. That humanitarian mission was left to the church and the church stepped up big time. And that's why we went there in the first place. It was like, how can we do this? And I look over and it's like, well, you have all these people in the church already doing the mission. They're already providing the aid. We don't need to do that. They're already going and evacuating people. We don't need to do that. How can we support them? Well, let's let's provide them with a baseline of training, you know, so they can continue to do it for long term so they can pass that information on to others, you know. And it, it's not about us doing something. It's about empowering the church 
in a, in a way that they can keep doing what what they're doing. But the, I, I I try to express that to people when I come back. It's like, man, the church in Ukraine, that's what's going to win. That's what's going to win the war. It, and yes, we need the men and those guys fighting. I'm, I'm a fighting man, right? I, I did 16 years. Uh, but uh, I also understand that wars are not won by, by bullets, you know, and, and, and they're won by the people coming together and working together to overcome evil. And that's exactly what you guys are doing. You're overcoming cowardice, which is one of the biggest things we hit on right now with our men. There is so much cowardice and so many people are afraid to acknowledge that but you're overcoming it. You're going anyway. You're doing what God's called you to do. And you're being really effective. And I think that is to me, it's amazing. And um, I look forward to continuing to do whatever I can. So we're working on some things. We'll see okay. in the near future. But uh, what do you think going forward? You guys are still working, right? You're still you're yeah. still providing aid and things like that. The mission hasn't stopped for you, even though it's out of the news cycle, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the greatest need for you guys going forward? How can we help you in the future with what you're doing? Well, uh, for now, I can tell you those training that you provide was uh, really useful. Uh, and right now we armed with knowledge and special instrument that will give us opportunity in case of second way of intrusion because there's so much conversation right now and on our borders so much uh, russian troops they waiting waiting for something and nobody tell us waiting what they waiting for but right now we focus on uh, on this if second way will happen what we need to do because if it will be happening then we will not be staying anymore. Sorry, again. In the city again. We'll beep it out. Yeah, because uh, those Russian troops already know how to move, where to go. They already know the landscape of uh, our region, and it will be easier for them to invade and take everything they want. So uh, we're thinking ahead. We do the plans. We right now it's like huge problem with uh, gasoline, with diesel. Everything is absent. All the gas stations are empty. And if somewhere will be gas, there will be line for five, six, eight hours. So right now we do some savings of gas, some groceries because we know that even there will be no invasion for the ne for the next few months. As we know that uh, autumn and winter will be hardest autumn and winter in Ukrainian nation history, it will be the hardest because we are just not ready. Lots of people have no windows, no doors in their houses. It's the city is not look normal anymore and it will be not the same as it used to be. So we're getting ready for the next wave or different things that could happen. We just want to be ready 100%. Then we have so much uh, customers. I call them customers because we as a ministry serve them, serve our people. And uh, there are a lot of them. And through the local social service we, with whom we work really tight, we try to help. Our organization have after school programs. Our organization have like special centers where we give out the special aid, for example, if it's mother with newborn baby and there are no chance for her to buy some food for the baby in the store we can provide we just try to be near and help all the to all the people who have a need so that's what that's the main thing right now for us so preparation to, stockpiling supplies yeah. is a big thing yeah. for you guys i think that's very smart something and i the last, do the last thing that i need to add that um, I already mentioned that right, right now, lots of people reach out through us to God, and we want to be helpful, want to mentoring those people and want to bring them to the God to the point when they will be repented and saved. Is that a need? Are you finding there's a lack of leadership right now in regard to that? People that can disciple, people that can provide that kind of 
mentorship? Is that something that's lacking, you think? Yes, it is lacking right now. We really, really looking forward to the people who are coming back from different places because uh, right now it's a big load or too much things to do to those people who are ready to serve. It's, it's too much in terms of people that need to be taken care got it so those things are going to be on our list of things to pray for and i know we can help you guys with the training and things like that and i think we'll, we'll continue to do that but if we can get you a, a pathway or a supply chain of some kind we're going to work on that as well and if anybody anybody in our audience people who are listening have have that or know something please let us know so we can connect you with with bogdan uh, a lot of that connection is going to go through Iron Edge for anonymity. People don't understand there's a lot of stuff. I, we have a lot of friends in Harrison, and, and the stories coming out of there about if you are not Orthodox, if you, you're automatically a collaborator with the West. And they're persecuting Christians in those regions. And we got to be careful about how we do what we do, be very careful about the security of what we do. We're going to continue to do that. I'm only doing this now because I've done my job of setting things up in Ukraine and I can talk about it now. But for all of our partners, um, nobody's ever going to know who you guys are directly unless they're meeting face to face in Ukraine. So we'll work on that. And I hope that we can get more training in there. The cool thing is Bogdan went through our training three times, four times, a lot. He went through yeah. a lot and he can teach it now. And we've given him the slides to teach that and the information to teach that. What we need to provide him now with is more of the equipment, the sat phones, go bags, things like that. And we're going to put together more of that so you can provide that with the training. But uh, we don't want to just limit it to that. There's, there's a lot, a huge need there. We need ongoing support for Ukraine. There was a lot of support that built up at the beginning, which is very important, I think. And it actually helped turn the tide of the war. I don't think people understand that. But... If the military had to focus on the humanitarian and the the fight, it, it would have fallen, fallen fallen apart pretty quickly. So the church is in the fight. The church is part of the reason why Ukraine is winning. Okay, so we need to keep that support going, and it's got to be. We need people who can think long term, ongoing support. You know, monthly support, things like that. I I've assessed a former intelligence officer that this is going to last for a few years at least. Regardless of whether somebody says ceasefire today, there's a lot of damage. There's more damage in that country than I've ever seen. I think the only thing we can compare it to is World War II. And so I think there's going to be a lot of rebuilding that's going to have to happen. At the same time, there's so much opportunity to minister, to, mm -hmm. to help these people who are in desperate need, looking to the church, looking to God now. And so mm -hmm. how, can we, how can we provide that? So we'll be working on that over the next few months for sure. Is there anything else that you want to, what would you say to, to, to the men in, in our group, the men who are sitting back and waiting for an opportunity to serve? What would you say to them based off your experiences now to do? What should they do? Well, from 2014, when this intrusion has be began, this war has began, I never thought that it could happen to me. Never. And I know that there are so many places where something is happening and those people not getting ready to such things like war or hunger uh, or something else. So I would, I would give this advice not to wait until something bad will happen and you will need to do something to take care of your family, of yourself, protect them or any other things, try to look opportunities to serve and try to find your place, your spot, because I know that God not giving us life just to you know spoil this life or wait for something. We all have some specific ass assessment, assignment to accomplish through our life. And to through that to show how how big is our faith and why we should be in the heaven with god we 
it's given by faith. It's given if we will be asking for, but I know that we all will have awards in heaven. And for example, I really want for everyone to have a, the biggest award in heaven from God because you was faithful and you saw the need and you try to answer those needs. You are not sitting somewhere in the back waiting for something to happen for you to do the action. So look forward, look opportunities. And I know there are so much opportunities all over the places. Just need to do, just need to start and act. Well, if that doesn't inspire you, I don't know what will. Um, what an incredible man, first of all. <laughs> just thanks to Bogdan for coming on with us. Uh, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. If you're waiting for something to happen uh, to prioritize your life, uh, you're going to be too late. Bogdan gave us the key right now. It's God, it's family, and it's ministry. And, and, and another word for ministry is service. So the, the houses, the vehicles, the finances, all that can be gone in a second. And for him, he left it like no questions asked to take care of his family and to serve those in need. So, uh, you know, that's my biggest takeaway. It's evident um, that that's what we should all be looking at right now and not wait until there's bombs and missiles flying over our, over our homes. Um, you know, the mission is still on, guys. Uh, if you heard anything, this ain't going away anytime soon. And so uh, we want to make sure that you know through Iron Edge, go to www.ironedgesharp.com. You can contribute right now because of the relationships that we have, the money and the resources are going to go right to the source for equipping them and for the people that they're going to train. Like we're not fooling around here, just throwing money, you know, at a, at an idea to help Ukraine to make people feel good. We're actually making a difference in people's lives. And for those of you that have supported us, uh, we just cannot thank you enough. Unfortunately, uh, we can't say all the names of all the people, uh, but, you know, we've been representing Kai's and Bogdan said off the record, those are the best protein bars I've ever had. I'm not just saying that to say that, um, but Kai's and so many churches and uh, so many unique individual donors, uh, just thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Um, you're making a difference and you're going to continue to make a difference. So go on to our website, uh, click support. And again, the money, the resources are going to go right to the source. Uh, please continue to pray for Bogdan and his family and the people of Ukra Ukraine. God is doing an incredible thing. The church is growing even in the midst of, of combat and conflict. And so he is faithful. We're going to continue to follow him and, and see the kingdom of God established here on earth.